The rolling mountains and densely packed forests of southwest Montana are truly a place where a person could feel alone. Second only to the isolation I experienced in Alaska during my army days. Excluding Yellowstone and Big Sky, this region is sparsely populated, but in the best kind of way. I hadn't had a vacation in at least three years, a real one. I hadn't been counting the weekend trips to Spokane or Coeurdeline or Helena. The Montana Highway Patrol had stationed me in Missoula three years ago, right out of field training. I enjoyed Missoula. It kept me busy enough, but I was ready for a break. The schedules finally aligned and I had enough seniority to take off 14 straight days. During my time in Missoula, I had been able to explore Glacier National Park, as well as Flathead and Kootenai National Forest fairly well. So I set my sights on Yellowstone. I had been back to the area since I was a kid, 10 years old or so, a family vacation or something. I didn't remember much of it. I had some campsites reserved inside the park itself, but also some in the surrounding Gallatin National Forest. I figured I would save some money on hotels and just a tent instead, since I was saving up to buy a house. I packed up all my camping supplies into my truck, as well as my faithful canine companion, Tango. Tango was a three-year-old Siberian Husky, Smart as a whip and with more energy than a nuclear reactor, he was a good companion and the best boy. After about a six hour drive, we arrived at the first campground near Earthquake Lake. I went to my reserve campsite and found that it was occupied. I went and talked with the elderly couple that were the hosts for the campground. They apologized profusely, as some glitch in their reservation system had double booked the campsite and I was just too late. There were no other sites in the campground available either. They offered me a full refund and a voucher for a free stay at another campground just down the road. They were positive this campground would be open and have sites for the next three nights. I thought it was a bit of a long shot since it was at peak tourist season. All the campsites were booked everywhere. I took the refund and the voucher, figuring I would at least check the place out before I drove to Big Sky to pay $300 per night for a hotel. Hollywood's Campground was the name. It was about a 10 minute drive from the previous site, nestled in dense lodgepole pines far off the main highway. The campground was quite beautiful. There was a small river along the southern end of the campground with a sheer mountain face on the opposite bank. The forest around it was thick and hard to see through. The towering lodge poles were packed together as densely as I had ever seen them. I had never heard of this place before. It hadn't come up in any of my searches when I was planning my trip months ago. As I was driving into the camp, I first noticed a permanently placed RV right at the center. Sitting out front with a sign that read, Welcome to Howling Woods. Please knock. Host always on duty. I got out of my truck and followed these signs instructions. After hearing some shuffling, an extremely elderly woman opened the door. She had skin tanned by a lifetime of working in the sun, and her once jet black hair had more gray in it than black. She squinted at me through wary brown eyes and offered me a toothless smile. I explained my situation and showed her the voucher. Oh, of course. Go ahead and pick out a spot and then come back and check in. I'll get some pamphlets for you. Her accent was Native American. And I got back in my truck and found a decent spot. The site was a clear and flat, with enough trees between the other sites that I could have some privacy. It was also close to the bathroom and the dumpster. A fire ring and a bear box sat in the middle of the small clearing, with a small picnic table just off center. The site was on the outer edge of the loop, so that the back of the site faced the open wilderness. I parked the tuck and slapped on Tango's leash. 
We took a long, lazy walk back to the host while I scoped out the other campers. From what I could tell, the campground was about three quarters full, an oddity for this time of year. The sites on both sides of me were occupied, one by a friendly middle-aged couple with Utah plates on their RV, and three Maltese ankle biters running circles around it. They waved at me and I chatted with them for a bit. They told me that this was their second honeymoon, after all eight of their children had finally moved out. The other site was temporarily home to a couple of 20-something guys, who didn't look up from their pipe when I passed them. The strong, skunky smell made me a bit sick as I passed. When I got back to the host, she had me fill out a simple sign-in sheet with my site number, name, and license plate. Then she handed me a small pamphlet about local hiking trails, a flyer about bear safety, and a small handwritten note. Intrigued, I opened up the note. In practiced cursive script, it said, Campground rules. Please extinguish all fires at dusk. Do not leave your tent or camper after dark. If you must leave your tent or camper after dark, do not use any light source. Move quickly and quietly. If you are walking at night and hear something behind you, do not run. Do not look back. Just ignore it. Do not make any loud noises after dark. If you hear anything moving outside of your tent or your camper at night, do not look at it. Stay in your shelter. Howls, barks, grunts, and snorts are just local wildlife and nothing to worry about. Earplugs are provided by the host free of charge. Do not leave any pets outside at night. Lock all doors on your vehicles and campers. Lock your tents if possible. Padlocks can be bought from the host. Do not leave the established trails or roads for any reason. Do not ever talk about what you see or hear in this campground. Odd set of rules, I commented. She looked up at me, a flash of anger across her old brown eyes. Her wrinkled brow furrowed. Faster than I thought possible, she lashed out and wrapped her bony fingers around my fist. Follow them, they are important, was the only explanation that she offered. There was a seriousness in her eyes that I had never seen before in anyone. And then she released her vice grip on my wrist. Okay, definitely. So, why is it called the Howling Woods? I've never heard of this place. The wildlife in this forest makes a lot of noise at night. It is quite a spectacle, but it is very important never to interact with them. You'll scare them off. Or worse, she explained. I thanked her for her help and set off back to my campsite, shoving the papers in my back pocket. I returned to the campsite, pitched the tent, loaded all the food into the bear box, and started a small fire. I drank a couple of Budweiser's and roasted some hot dogs over the open flames. I popped open a book and read a few chapters and drank a few more beers. Dusk snuck up on me pretty fast. I cleaned up the mess and took out my phone to check the weather. I had no cell service, but that certainly wasn't a surprise in this country. I took the beer cans to the nearest dumpster and did my best at the vault toilet. It was just getting dark as I got back to my tent. I chained up Tango while I got the tent ready, turning on my electric lantern. While I was laying out the sleeping bag, Tango barked. Tango, like most huskies, had a personality. He had quirks like a human does. He was a talker and would often howl and talk back to me in that strange husky noise but he only ever barked when he was scared. I jumped almost through the top of the tent. I grabbed a can of bear spray and a flashlight from my nearby pack and tore out the front flap of the tent. Tango was cowering under the picnic table, visibly shaking. I had never seen this before. I shined the flashlight around the clearing and saw nothing. Beyond the cone of light, the woods were dark. The lodge poles scattered the beam, making it hard to see anything beyond the clearing. I coaxed them out from under the table 
and ushered him inside the tent. His tail was between his legs and he was shaking. A year ago, Tango and I were about six miles deep on a backcountry trail in the Kootenai National Forest. We turned a corner on the trail and came face to face with a grizzly. Tango nearly pulled me face first into the dirt in an attempt to run at the bear, utterly fearless and completely oblivious to the size of it. Seeing him react in such a way now made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. But I forced myself to think nothing more of it though. I figured the bear had just caught him by surprise and had run off when it heard me coming. I turned off the lantern and settled into my sleeping bag, still a bit unnerved. However, the beers and exhaustion eventually aided sleep in coming fast enough. I wasn't sure how long I had been asleep. One tango barked again. I sat straight up. Every hair on his body was pulled straight up and his eyes were transfixed on the front flap of the tent. Still, coming out of my deep sleep state, it took me a second to hear it. The sound of the front flap of the tent being unzipped. In the dark, I could barely make out the zipper moving slowly. Gun or bear spray flashlight, the options raced through my groggy brain. I reached for my duffel bag and drew out my Glock 20 from its holster. I always kept it with me out in the wilderness as a last resort for bear defense. I flicked on the weapon mounted lights and shouted, Stop what you're doing or you will be shot. The zipper stopped moving. I could just vaguely see the silhouette of what looked like a large person crouched on the opposite side of the flap. Tango began to growl this time, posturing for a fight. And then suddenly, the silhouette was gone. I could hear something large tear off into the distant brush behind the tent. I barreled out of the flap, gun in hand and Tango right on my heels. I shined the light around the clearing, again seeing nothing. Tango stood transfixed and staring at the certain point out in the dark woods. His hackles were still raised and a low growl emerged from his throat. Oh, what the heck? The chilly wind and frosty mountain air drove me back into the tent quickly. I set my gun back in the pack. My hands were shaking. What the heck was that? I asked Tango. He stared at me, his blue eyes offering no answers. The rest of the night, I laid in my sleeping bag. Sleep would not come to me this time the adrenaline refusing to leave my system. And to make things worse, the howling had started. A chorus of bone-chilling howls arose through the night air. They didn't sound like wolf or coyote. I had never heard anything like it, and all the nights that I had spent in the mountains. It went on for hours, making sleep impossible. The howls started far off, but eventually... It sounded like these sources had moved into the campground. I could hear them coming from different directions, some close to my tent, some far away. One that sounded like it was right behind my tent, loud, almost ear-splitting, a ghostly, mournful howl. I gripped my pistol tight, waiting for something to happen, but then it just stopped. It all stopped. Eventually, the light of day began to show through the walls of the tent. I prodded Tango awake, telling him that if I was awake, he had to be too. I pulled on some warm clothes and exited the tent. Sitting at my picnic table was the elderly woman that hosted the campground. I jumped back, reaching towards my right hip for a gun that wasn't there out of reflex. In a calm, soft tone, she said, you broke the rules. What? You broke the rules. You had your dog out past dark. You used a lantern past dark. You were out of your tent past dark. You didn't lock your tent. Yeah, so? Those rules are there for a reason. To keep you from attracting unwanted attention. Uh, attention from what? The creatures of the woods. Something tried to open my tent, 
No animal can do that. Would you like to buy a padlock? I sighed. Yeah, sure. She reached into her purse and tossed one to me. Five bucks. I fished through the tent until I found my wallet and handed over a five dollar bill. Follow the rules, she stated one more time, befitting getting up and walking away. I stood there for a bit, pondering what the last eight hours had entailed. Tango whined at his food bowl and snapped me back into the real world. I took out my griddle and made some eggs and bacon. Tango looked at his bowl of kibble and then at me with his sad eyes. And I broke down and scooped some of the eggs into his bowl. The marijuana enthusiasts at the next site over were talking about the howls one last night. Stating that they were freaking sketchy bro. I nodded in agreement to myself. I cleaned up camp and changed into some hiking clothes. I loaded up the dog and the day pack into the truck and went off to find some hiking trails. Exhausted, after a day of about 15 miles of hiking, I collapsed into my camp chair. I had about two hours before dusk. Rattled from the nights at previous events, I figured I would strictly hold myself to the rules for the rest of my stay. I had considered leaving, but the campground was gorgeous and free. A hotel nearby would cost 600 bucks or more for a two-night stay. I figured if I followed the rules like the host said, I would be fine. Camp was cleaned and the tent was arranged long before the sunset. Tango and I were bedded down and comfy cozy when dark came. I looped the padlock through the holes in the zippers of the tent flap and I locked it. My Glock was set directly next to my sleeping bag, along with a spare mag. I read a few chapters in my book while Tango started snoozing. The howling started around 10pm. A cacophony of strange howls almost moans. Twelve full minutes of this. I almost enjoyed them, listening as they would get closer, hearing them move around the camp. Wolves or coyotes I assumed. Nothing else could make a noise like that, and Tango didn't even seem to be perturbed by them tonight. Once they had stopped, I snuggled deeper into my bag, ready for sleep. A light rain came down, and I could hear it splatter off the rain fly on the tent. And then came the worst feeling that could possibly come. I gotta freaking go to the bathroom. I should have known better. I should have brought an empty bottle into the tent or something. I never thought of it. I let it tangle, sprawled out and snoring. Am I really gonna do this? I asked Tango. He snored in response. I pulled on a hoodie and slipped on my slides. Pausing, I dig around for the list and I double check. No light, got it. The bathroom was a hundred or so yards away if I walked the road. I figured that was the safer option without light. I contemplated taking my gun, but I had no way to carry it. The waistband of my sweatpants wouldn't keep it in place. I opted for the bear spray and I shoved it in my pocket. Tango didn't even wake up as I slept out of the tent. I took the padlock off and then relocked the tent from the outside, making sure nothing would bother my buddy. I struggled with leaving him alone in the tent, but the rule said no pets out after dark. I made my way easily enough to the vault toilet and did my business. As I was leaving, the dew-covered dirt handle slipped, and the door loudly slammed shut. Crap. I whispered under my breath. I broke another rule. I started my walk back to the tent. I could hear something moving in the dense forest beside me. Ignore it. I kept walking. And then it stopped as soon as it had begun. Or at least, I thought it did. After a few steps, I noticed that I could hear soft footsteps behind me, but only when I stopped. My heart started pounding. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. A chill ran down my spine. Ignore it. It seemed like it was timing its own steps to match mine. It purposefully was making sure I didn't know it was there. 
It's stalking me. Ignore it. Follow the rules. Every fiber of my being told me to run. I knew that it wouldn't do me much good running these slides. I gripped the bear spray tight in my hand. Its steps were getting louder. It was gaining on me. I finally reached the tent. I now dialed to unlock the padlock fumbling in the dark. I could feel it behind me. My hands were shaking. It was taking forever to enter the combination. It exhaled. I could feel its hot breath on the back of my neck. Ignore it. Finally, the lock popped open. I unzipped the flap just enough for me to squeeze in and shut it quickly behind me. I dove for the gun and quickly pointed it at where I thought it was, careful not to turn on the light. Silence. I reached forward and put the lock back in, struggling to do so with one hand, while the other hand held the gun out in front of me. The lock snapped shut. Silence. Movement. Walking. It was walking away. Trudging through the undergrowth away from the tent. In the pitch black, I didn't see Tango walk up and lick my face. And good boy, back to sleep. He obeyed, circling his spot three times and collapsing once more. I took a few minutes for the shaking to stop, and then a few more minutes for me to put the gun back down. Sleep came slowly, not fast enough. I could hear the door of the camper next door open. The Mormons. Well, I guess I assumed there were Mormons. They were letting their dogs out by the sound of it. Bad idea. The dogs yipped and yapped, even wandering over to my sight. I could hear one panting and sniffing a few yards from my tent. The panting and sniffing became barking and growling, and the barking and growling turned to yelping and whimpering. Tango shot straight up, his eyes fixed at the point in the tent wall where the sound was coming from. I dived at him, wrapping my arms around his snout to keep him from making any noise. Shh, boy, be quiet. I could hear movement. The yelping dog was running around my campsite, through it. It was getting further away and now it was coming back, yelping all the way. And then, there was a much larger rush of movement, and the yelping stopped. The RV door opened, and it sounded like the other two dogs scampered up the stairs. Lucy, Lucy, the man called. Bad idea number two. A light slashed through my tent. He must have turned on a flashlight to look for the dog. I could hear him walk down the stairs and start trudging through the undergrowth. Number three. Eric, come inside. Lucy will be fine. I'm sure she's just exploring. A female voice called out. His wife. Yeah, yeah. He trudged up these stairs and the door closed. I released my grip on Tango, and he licked my face again. I couldn't hear anything else moving around. Ignore it. I ignored what I just heard and tried to go back to sleep. It came easier than it should have and the bliss of slumber washed over me. Morning came faster than it had any right to. I got dressed and took Tango outside. He did his business in the bushes and padded back over to me. I noticed a bit of red on his front right paw. Ah, oh, bud, what happened there? I knelt down and examined his paw. I couldn't find any cuts or sores. And then I noticed he had something on his back paws too. And then it clacked. I stood up and walked over to the spot where Tango had done his business. It was about ten yards behind my tent in the undergrowth. A smear of red covered the ground. Red and white fur. Red splattered painted the trunks of the lodgepoles surrounding the area. Oh... Lucy, it was too early. The couple in the RV hadn't seemed to have woken up yet. Should I tell them? I would want to know, but the rules say not to talk about it. I decided against it. 
Whatever this place was, I was getting pretty freaked out by it. But just one more night, I hurried up and packed up my day pack. I bundled Tango into the truck and we took off for a good 14 mile trail that would keep us busy all day. After a day of beautiful mountain meadows, surreal river views, gorgeous lakes, and 14 miles of walking, Tango and I returned to the campsite. I packed up everything that we wouldn't need for the night into the truck. I noticed the RV in the next site, the couple with the three dogs, well, two dogs now I guess, were gone. No surprise there. However, the younger gentlemen on the other side of me were still there. Dinner was just a dehydrated hiking meal, since all the good food was packed up in the truck. I planned to get out of this place as quickly as I could in the morning. Sundown started coming and Tango and I got into the tent, locking it up behind us. I read a few chapters in my book until it was too dark to make out any of the words. Sleep came pretty easy tonight, but as is tradition, it didn't last very long. A twig snapping told me someone or something was stumbling around in the underbrush next to my tent. I checked my phone and it was around midnight. Not great, but at least I had slept through the house tonight. I could make out a couple of voices. The young guys from next door. Do you see anything? One of them had whispered. Nah, but it's definitely out there. The other said. My mind raised. These idiots were going to get themselves killed. I zipped open a small window on the side of my tent and I looked through the screen. They had flashlights out and were tramping around in the underbrush. They looked like they had their phones out in front of them, as if they were recording something, and then it stepped out of the woods into their light. Whether it was a man, a beast, or a strange combination of both, it was terrifying. I had never felt such utter, visceral fear. Seven or eight feet tall, burning red eyes and a body covered in patchy, greasy fur. Long claws and a protruding snout, fangs and slobber hanging off of it. They froze for a second, and then they ran, back to their tent, diving in. I reached over and grabbed my gun. I had to do something. But by the time that I was out of my tent, it had torn into theirs. Red and viscera flying as it tore into them. Furious. It was odd how silent the savagery was. I backed away, careful not to make any more noise. It got back in my tent and I locked it. What else could I have done? They were already gone. I pulled Tango close and kept a white knuckle grip on my Glock. I could hear it now, slurping and smacking, like it was an eight-year-old having spaghetti at an olive garden. Follow the rules. I did my best to sleep that night. When I finally rose, I realized it was daytime, midday almost. I opened my tent to find a cop car and blocking my truck in. A deputy sheriff was talking with another camper, pen and notebook in hand. When I glanced over at the next site, a group of people were loading a body bag into an ambulance. Scanning again, I noticed another deputy walking towards me, staring in grim look on his face. I flashed my badge and he seemed to relax a bit. Hey, you hear anything last night? Follow the rules. No, why? What happened? He gestured towards the body bags. A couple of campers got ate by a bear, it looks like. You were 50 feet away and you didn't hear anything. No, hard day of hiking and all. We were pretty tired and we slept heavy. Sorry. No worries, he sighed. He gave him my name and contact info, and he let me go. I packed up the tent as quickly as I could, and I squeezed my truck past the cop car. On my way out, I stopped at the host site. I nodded, she answered. What the heck is this place? I blurted out. She smiled. Someplace ancient, not meant for our kind, but yet here we are. I hope you enjoyed your stay and then she shut the door in my face. I stared at the closed door. A tap from the window shocked me out of it, 
From the window of the camper, she mouthed the words, Follow the rules, to me. And so I did, and I laughed. Tango and I had a wonderful vacation, but the mountains have never felt the same to me since. The feeling of being watched, being followed, it's always there now. I moved not long after to Salt Lake City. I rarely go camping anymore, though Tango and I love our day hikes. I follow the rules, still to this day, every time that I go camping. Surely, that's what she meant.